my name is Brian Francis. I am a uh, contributing editor at GammaSutra.com and at GDC. I'm the community manager slash video person in general uh, who's around the office uh, figuring out how to make things like this happen. Um, it's lovely to see you all today. I hope some of you are coming here from the Gamma Sutra Twitch channel, which is where uh, some of you may know my face and voice from. Um, uh, we are here today uh, because for the first time ever, we're going to be using the GDC Twitch channel um, to host conversations with game developers as we get ready for GDC 2019. Yeah. Um, I think our game's coming Company in a bit mild, so I'm going to turn it down just a little. Um, you need very to the usually, uh, oh, that's why it's left. That's different. Um, okay, fix that. Um... Right, uh, if you don't know what GDC is, it's the Game Developers Conference. Um, I can see in chat, I can recognize Clifton B as someone who I've seen replying to our social media. Just going to give a shout out to Novin Works 2. We are here today um, with our first ever stream with a game called Return of the Oberdin. This comes from developer Lucas Pope, and normally I'm the person who is uh, invisible in these chats so that you can see our guest's face. But today our guest has opted to uh, remain in the shadows and speak from a distance. Uh, Lucas, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Hey, everybody. Um, uh, we are here. Um, this game came out, Return of the Oberdin came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's been in development for how many years, Lucas? Uh, four and a half from start to finish. Four and a half years, and it is uh, the the is pitched as a mercant... I actually have it over here on Twitter. Um, a uh, uh, mercantile mystery, I think is the phrasing. Um, you are an insurance inspector... Checking out the ship, uh, the Ober Durham, which is returned to harbor, and using a mysterious tool that lets you uh, relive uh, the events of certain people's death to find out how they died and figure out what happened. Um, as you can see, uh, today we're playing um, we're playing the game, but we're looking at some footage I already captured of me playing it. So what you're seeing isn't live, but so we won't you won't be able to yell at me if I'm getting stuff wrong. But you will be able to ask Lucas about questions about what you're seeing if you had a similar experience. Um, Clifton, to answer your question in chat, we are, this is the first hour of the game, we're only going to go for an hour, so the only spoilers will be me figuring out a few of the mysteries, or maybe I got them wrong. Maybe the spoiler is that I am bad at video games. Um, in chat, uh, quick shoutouts to, um, El Calhau, Seshi, um, oh, Seshi, we had you on the channel, on the Gama Sutra a while back, I recognize your name. Um, Volkiller Games, uh, Starlight Skies... A lot of great people in chat. We really want your questions for Lucas today because as, as good as my questions are, um, if you are in the business of making games yourself, you should absolutely be asking Lucas uh, um, what his experience was working on Oprah Din. Um, Lucas, my first question for you today. Um, I think a lot of people have heard of you because of Papers, Please. Um, how did you transition from Papers, Please to working on Return of the Oprah Din? Uh, good question. I basically wanted to do something totally different from papers please that's generally how i move on to the next project because mm -hmm. I, I, I get so tired of whatever i was doing before i want to change everything up and Oberdin papers please was kind of design first project mm -hmm. uh, where i had the idea for the mechanics and this one Oberdin was visuals first so more art focused i wanted to make something one bit mm -hmm. and just kind of banging on that for a while ended up with this uh setting on the ship and then after a few months the core concept of figuring out how people died Right on. Um, I think it's actually, I think maybe it's worth stopping there on the art focus for a moment. Um, uh, we have an old feature from GammaSutra.com talking to you about the one, one bit dither punk is the way we phrased it. I don't know if that's like, I don't know if that's entirely accurate. Um, what exactly is this one bit aesthetic? Um, what inspired you to chase to like work on a game with it and how, how does it work? Cause it's really beautiful. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so ditherpunk is a great word, actually. I love that word. Um, and that article is the first time I heard it. It's uh, basically me taking what I played as a kid, which is Macintosh Plus games, which were w one bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the time, they were actually high resolution. It was only 512 by 342 or something crazy like that. But it's on a 9-inch screen, so it was very sharp, very striking for me as a kid. And I played a lot of games that way. And I specifically remember never thinking it's hard to remember not thinking something but for me i never thought i want more colors here i it, to me it always looked beautiful mm -hmm. uh, in one bit and so papers please had some level of art in it but it wasn't really art focused and 
I like to pretend I'm an artist, so I thought what I want to do is take this one-bit style that I played as a kid and try to make it legible and playable now using modern technology. So that was the idea. And then I, I mocked up a few things. What's in interesting to me is that title screen uh, for the game is the first thing I ever mocked up in one bit in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And it's also the, the first thing that I made in Unity. And it didn't change for the entire four and a half years. So that basically, once I got that working, it taught me that it was possible and it could look cool. And that sent me four years down the line. Nice. Um, uh, I think I, when I was doing some research for this game, I found some great gifs about how you were like trying to make this work for the ship itself. Uh, we're looking now at, on screen at some really good, uh, some good people model. You know, the architecture of the ship itself. Um, what's the process for for taking? You know, this starting at it has to be a one bit ship and making sure that these people, these objects are still legible. Because you can kind of see a difference between the people and the gun, like the the captain here. I guess that's a spoiler that he's the captain. Um, uh, so careful about that. Literally everyone's identity on the stream is a spoiler, so if you're sensitive, uh, but yeah, the gun he's holding there is obviously very different from his own model himself. What's, 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 how come? Yeah, okay, so the first thing I did was I, I played some old actual Mac first person games, and the best one that I could find was something called Colony. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's a very low poly, just the walls kind of thing, um, but one of the things from playing that game and also playing some modern one-bit games where they just they take the, the render and they dither it. And it looks cool, but you can't see what's going on. You can't see anything. So the in these modern games, in the colony, you can see everything very clearly. And I decided that everything is going to have an outline. So geometric shapes are going to be outlined. And if it's, if it's against white, they'll have a black outline. If it's against black, they'll have a white outline. So it's always an inverse, and it's always the shapes and geometry are always clear to see. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that is that it removes any mystery about where you are or the environment. Everything is perfectly defined, basically, uh, which was fine because I wasn't making a horror game, so I didn't want to hide things from the player. It was okay that everything was, was you could tell where you were all, at all times, which is kind of what I was going for. So that's that, that was on the surface, a simple thing that, like, how can I make this work? Okay, everything is outlined. Um, but as the, the, the kind of production progressed, bigger problem became uh, comfort, viewing comfort. Because everything, you've only got two colors to work with, and you, you need to make shades out of those using dithering. But dithering is not a technology that you want to use in a moving picture, basically, be, because it gives you a headache, more or less. The, there's too many flashing pixel, high contrast pixels. So the real magic for me in making this work was getting solving that dithering problem and figuring out how to make it so people could play a four-hour game without getting massively uh, uncomfortable. Right on. Um, what uh, what were the first... Um, you said it's uncomfortable to look at. What were the first solutions that worked in terms of getting people... Like, in terms of lowering discomfort? Which is... I don't think... Usually I'm asking developers about that when we're in VR, but I haven't asked a developer about that in conventional games in some time. Yeah. Well, the first solution is just to increase the resolution. Uh, so your pixels are smaller, so that when you dither, your eyes fooled more into thinking it's a, a tone instead of just a dot, bunch of dots. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the other, like, I wanted it to be one bit, but I also wanted it to be low resolution. And that was partly because of production. It makes it easier to create this thing when it's not super high res. But also, I just like that style more. I like the lower resolution. I like trying to do more with less pixels. Mm -hmm. So when I decided I couldn't raise the resolution to solve that, um, I put off the problem for a long time, a couple years. And then finally when I started, I had enough to sort of sit down and play a lot of it full screen in front of me. Uh, I changed the dither pattern basically. So it didn't, it wasn't trying to be shades so much as it was trying to be kind of a woodcut, uh, more pattern style, uh, mm -hmm. which worked okay. It worked fine to me. Uh, it looked okay. But um, in the TigSource devlog, which I kept for the game, nobody else liked it. Everybody hated it. So I kind of went back to the drawing board and devised a dithering technique that keeps the dither uh, sort of fixed when you're looking around. So when you turn your head, the dither pattern is not sort of sliding across as you would expect. It's moving with the scene. And that took a lot of time to get right. And in the end, uh, you don't really notice it, except that my hope is that you don't get sick as much as you would have with the other one. I'm not saying I fixed everything, but it uh, makes it more, much more comfortable to look at when you're just standing there looking around. 
Right on. Um, uh, moving on from the art, although if folks in questions have chat, uh, feel feel free to feel free to ask them. Um, Clifton points out that uh, Innuendo Studios um, talks about how this game, like the the one bit graphics of Oberdin, are sort of different than the one bit graphics of the Macintosh games. Um, my next question is going to be about uh, that process of moving from like this art style into the design of the game because it's interesting to hear you about you going from design first to art first um after after you had the art style um what was your process for figuring out the like what was what was fun about this style like what where did the inter where did the design interaction come from uh originally i had big plans for this game that you would actually go back in time and you would relive the death mm -hmm. uh, but you, everything was moving you'd have to replay how they died so there was this idea that you go back in time Someone's got to die. It's either going to be you or the person that you're sort of embodying. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, that was way too much work. Nothing I could do uh, that way. But once I started getting this rendering technique down and started getting some visuals up and some characters on screen, I realized it looks good just as it is. Just mm -hmm. still, if you could walk around a still scene, that would look good. So the idea sort of changed to be just go back and hear the audio and then see the frozen scene. Uh, and that took me through the initial demo because there were, I think there were four people in the initial demo for this in 2014. And that was easy. I, whatever dialogue or characters or text I wrote then was with nothing else in mind. I didn't have any of the story written at that time. Just kind of, okay, these guys will be fighting over something and the captain ends up killing a bunch of them and whatever. Mm -hmm. That worked for the, the progress I'd made at that time. Uh, and I kind of stuck with this idea that the game would be about figuring out how people died. I stuck with that for a long time um, until I realized that uh, that's not hard to tell. Usually, you can usually see how people die pretty easily. Like, like this guy. Yeah, I mean, he's getting hit by somebody, so yeah, yeah, not much challenge there. Uh, it, but it wasn't until I kind of had a lot more of the game done that I realized the real fun part would be figuring out who they are, because mm -hmm. that that would lead into ways I can create clues in the environment and have the player kind of work out a, a clue like or a. Moriarty, like it's this old game, kind of logic puzzle to figure out who people are. So that mm -hmm. that design shifted, and that design, that shift happened kind of late, I want to say, because working out the narrative structure for this game was pretty tough. You you have to tell, you can only tell the story when somebody dies, first off, and then I also needed to have this kind of almost unbroken chain of bodies going back through time, which you know probably isn't that normal, um, and so I decided to break it up into chapters or disasters and then lay everything out like that 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 structure was extremely difficult to figure out mm -hmm. which uh tied my hands a bit because i might have changed design in a different way if i hadn't gone put all that work into the story but once i put all the work into the story I, I was stuck with it and i had to figure out a way to make it work and that way was basically the book and focusing more on the identities than the means of death that's really interesting so the kind of the order is art um revisiting a death um figuring out who the people are who died not how they died although as you can see how they died is still part of it um uh and then segmenting and, and splintering the stories and i just want to point out for everyone at home i'm about to i think i'm about to no i didn't wind up scrolling through the whole list but um it's 60 plus people right on the boat that's 60 plus bodies yeah and, and that's a case where that's a lot yeah, when I decided that it was going to be on a ship, because I thought that would be easy, I can model a ship, four decks of a ship, no problem. That was my first big mistake on the game. But once I decided that, I did a lot of research on these ships, and I started building the ship. Uh, and then, I don't know why, but I, I looked at the number of the people that you would need to, to sail one of these ships, and it was maybe 120 people, 200 people. And... Obviously, I knew, okay, I'm smart enough, I, don't, I can't do 120 people, but maybe I could do 80. So my first number was 80 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I actually made all the characters, I realized, damn, the most I can do is 60. Uh, I'm going crazy doing these characters, so I'll stop at 60. But this was all before I'd worked out the story. So if I'd worked out the story first, there'd be 12 people on the tiny sailboat, basically. Uh, but yeah. because I, wor I worked on the ship and, and the reality of what you would need to sail these ships, I started super high. And I felt like every time I cut it down, I was going to compromise the game, not realizing that I was still going to kill myself to try to finish 60 people. Um, I'm going to have questions about, quote-unquote, uh, killing yourself uh, later on, because, you know, production, quality of life, these are things that developers are talking about uh, yeah. in 2018. But 
um, just to keep us roughly on track here. So uh, I had another game developer on the stream once tell me that the difference between, like, the, the thing that I've thought about, especially when it comes to, like, the number of factors in making a game, is the difference from 0 to 1 is shorter than the distance from 1 to 2. Um, uh, and, and I guess I'm curious, one, every time, I mean, you started off with 80 and then dropped down to 60, how much does one character like increase the load i guess like what what do you know roughly how you know from a dev standpoint how much time that cutting those 20 people shaved off uh no i couldn't say that actually making the characters themselves was not hard the hard part is weaving that into a story that i felt wouldn't start dragging or mm -hmm. having too much for the player to worry about i mean at that point when i chose 60 I was this is awesome thinking, by the way sorry real, just this scene right here when this pops uh, up this is incredible thank you yeah but so continue. At, the time, at that time, I wasn't. I don't know. I wasn't thinking about much of the, arranging the story or the player's experience or anything. I was just thinking about I need a bunch of people for the ship, and I'll figure out the rest later. Mm -hmm. And I, I had the manifest still, uh, and the man, and I, that's all I had was just a list of the names. So, the project kind of scaled at different times. Mm -hmm. One at, at some point, this doesn't scale, so I got to scale it up, and then. I move over to some other thing, and that doesn't scale, so i got to scale it up. And they all kind of scale in different ways without really changing the other th elements of the game because I didn't want to re remake them. Or I felt like I could still do something good with them, so keep those and scale this guy up. And that, that comment about 0 to 1 and 1 to 2, for me, was absolutely true for the beginning of the game because I, I created the demo in just a few months, the initial demo. But everything that I had for that demo did not scale. So the fact that there are four characters there, I was already pushing up against all the pipeline and tools, custom things that I created to make those four guys. So the, there was mm -hmm. no way that the tools and the, the, the systems I had would scale up to 60 people. So that added almost another year of scaling up to the point where I could make the full game from the demo. And this is true of every game I've ever worked on. If you look at like the first prototype of anything, it's hard to imagine how much time it took to go from that to the final thing because in a lot of cases it looks just like the final game with some small differences but in most cases you had to change everything about your production and the way you made the game in order to get from that first initial thing to the end right on um i i could kind of i want i uh i guess i want to lean into you know having now like from papers please uh, what is your kind of your guiding star when you know you you have a cool idea, you begin working on the idea, you work on the demo, the prototype, and you you think you have these sets of tools that will get you through the whole game. What's your guiding star when moving between demo to full game and uh sort or proof of concept to full game that you think other indie developers like uh, could learn from? Um, for me, it was potential. So yeah. once I had made the demo, if I feel this potential there and if other people who play it feel this potential there it doesn't matter if i can reach that or if i have any idea how to reach it if it has potential then it's enough because that's enough for me to get thinking about it more mm -hmm. so when i transitioned from papers please to Oberdin, during development of papers please i had collected a lot of game ideas i'm always writing down kind of game ideas in in a notebook somewhere or something just like quick off one-off ideas of something that could become a game and the ones that i think about the most are the ones that I, I work on next. So even though there's lots of ideas there, some of them, even without checking a notebook, they keep coming back in my mind and I'm thinking about them. So that becomes the next game I work on. And it was the case with this demo that if I release the demo, people enjoy it and they think it has a lot of potential. And I keep thinking about it. I keep working through my mind what that potential could be or how it could be uh, executed. Then that's, that's it. That's good for me. Nice. Um, I guess, uh, let me go uh, really quick while I'm going through my question bucket. I'm going to remind chat that you can ask questions too. Um, and especially if you are working on a game of your own, please uh, ask them. Uh, my, my game working experience is, uh, is, is, I've got some, but it's not, it's not as much as I'm sure some of you folks at home have. And we'd love to ask them for you. That's what GDC and uh, Gama Sutra are all about. Uh, which uh, I guess I should... Uh, I guess I need to give the obligatory that GDC and Gamma Sutra are both owned by the same parent organization, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, one question that comes from my good colleague, Alex Walro, who's normally with me uh, when we're doing these streams, but uh, is sadly not with us today because the hour is late here in California. Um, uh, what has proven interesting about the plebeian and the mundane in your design? You've now made a game 
about an insurance agent. You've made a game about a border agent, newspaper editors. Um, why do these genres catch your attention, and what do you think? What do you think it takes to translate the boring into the interesting for game design? For the first question, I, when it comes to design, I'm a big fan of uh, rigid core mechanics. So if something very basic and simple that you're doing, and you're kind of filling out a matrix of features or your uh, a list of identities, something like simple and core, just as a kind of o slightly OCD engineer, I like that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where I come from on the design side. Um, on the on the other side, I, I really like taking those things and making something interesting out of them, story-wise. You know, there are people around the world who do all kinds of jobs, all the time, and many of those jobs are boring and mundane, but those people have interesting lives to me. So I like trying to capture the interesting parts of the, a mundane experience, and that's that works really well when you like mundane mechanics, because the two of them go together, those two interests go together really well. So that's kind of what directs me to pick an idea and to develop it and then evolve it into a full game. And then the second part of that question was, um, uh, or maybe you explained it, was sort of what is your mindset about taking those mundane parts or the, the interesting parts of mundane things and making them playable? There's a nice challenge there, I guess. that I, In every project I do, I approach it like an engineer. Mm -hmm. So as if there's a problem that needs to be solved. So if there's no problem, then I'm not that interested. But if there's a problem, if there's some restriction or some limitation, then I'm interested suddenly. And that, that's why I have one bit. That's why I have simple mechanics that you wouldn't expect mm -hmm. uh, to, to build a story out of. I try to do exactly that. Just because that solving those problems are the most interesting and fun parts of game development for me. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I guess like it wouldn't... Um, under that philosophy, it, it makes more sense to make games like this as opposed to games, you know as opposed to like a very polished 2D side scroller that uh, that can do well on PS4 I guess. Um, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't know how to make that kind of game because I don't I don't understand the problems that I, yeah, I don't see the problems that would be fun to solve there basically. Right. Um, not to slam that the my comment isn't to slam that genre of game of course because I really love those kind of games like Owlboy is one of my favorites. Um for instance, uh, but I just that was just a comparison. Um, I have more questions, but we're going to give chat a shot. Starlight Skies uh, says they work at IndieCade, um, and they would like to know um, how much feedback uh, from going to events has helped you out. I, I, I would st layer that question with how do you organize your event feedback so that it's useful, and how do you make sure you know uh, you're getting good feedback and not feedback from someone who would never buy the game in real life, but they just happen to be there. Oh, right, this scene. Uh, first off, hi Star. Um, we've met a couple times mm -hmm. at different events. So that's a good question. I I live in the middle of nowhere. I was telling you earlier, and I don't see anybody basically related to games for most of the time. So um, I have an online presence, but physically I don't meet a lot of game developers. Um, so or players even. Mm -hmm. So events for me are mostly about getting feedback. Um, I don't publicize that much when I go to an event. I don't do any marketing or anything. I set up a booth and I try to watch people play the game. And so for me, that's critical. And that's not necessarily uh, perfect. Showing a game at an event is very different than uh, watching somebody play it, you know, alone in their room or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, for me, a good way to gauge kind of what's... It's a good way to compare it against other games. It's a kind of a... Are people playing this game compared to some other game? So not in, in isolation, it's not that useful, except if somebody gets stuck. If everybody's getting stuck somewhere, okay, I need to change this. Or if everybody's confused about something, then I feel like, okay, I need to change that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more, how many people are playing this game? How many people are interested? How many people come out to check it out? Because it's surrounded by other way cooler games and lots of people playing lots of different stuff. So to me, it's, the value of an event is mostly in just determining how it fits with other games. Um, and as far as organizing that feedback, I don't really. <laughs> it's um, whatever kind of bubbles to the top is what I think about and think of fixing. I'll write down some things usually if people are getting stuck somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more kind of the general feeling of how it's going and how, how the game is doing and what people think of it. And this ties in, this is kind of a general philosophy of mine where 
I used to make game. I, I made a game for iOS called uh, Helsing's Fire, and back then, this was in 2010 or something. Back then, it was really important to get analytics to to record what everybody was doing, how far they got, uh, basically all this information that lets you design a better game. And so I recorded a ton of analytics for everybody who played this game, and I never looked at them. So after that incident where I put all this work into collecting information, but never actually looking at it, because I was. I'm always on to the next thing. I don't really want to make a Hellsing Spire 2 and to mm -hmm. improve and to fix everything. I just want to do something totally different. So I kind of got into the situation where I'm I'm not going to really... I'm not going to do the analytic thing, basically, which uh, a lot of people do for design. I'm just going to try to hear the problems, understand the problems, and fix them as they come up. And if I don't hear it, then I never fix it, you know, which is kind of the downside of that whole thing. Um, but... So far, it's worked out okay, and it will probably crash and burn for the next one. Uh, once again, I, I, I hate to feel like I'm just overly praising, but uh, that was, a, like, the way these scenes start, like, the really striking images that you bash into. Holy crap, cow. Like, playing this game, this experience that we're playing right here, you can see me just freeze and just stare at it a minute before and sinking it in before, like, actually starting to move around. Cool. That was one of the things that, I, yeah, the, about the very first demo that, told me that this could work the way that the, the basic structure of hearing the audio and then slamming into the 3d scene with the music at the same time i felt okay i could do some cool stuff with that mm -hmm. from the very beginning um clifton b would like to know um is the memento mortem at all inspired by the memory amulet from mist 4 i never played mist actually so fair uh, i no. <laughs> it's it's a game that i um i wanted to play for a long time but if you it is, there's a thing where if you miss a game when it first comes out, you almost never go back to it. So, that was my case with Mist. Unfortunately, I never played it. Um, I guess that that loosely wanders us over to game game marketing because I assume you know it's very important for you to get Oberdin in people's hands now because later there will be you know Red Dead Redemption Three or whatever, um, and not Oberdin. Um. How much time and energy did you spend on game marketing? Since you said you didn't use events to market, you used them primarily for feedback. And how did you set a sales expectation that you knew could keep you, you know, fed, so that you could work on making um, uh, Papers, Please, Two Electric Boogaloo? Huh. Uh, let's see. Uh, I didn't. Papers, please. So first off, I'm not the marketing kind of guy. I didn't market yeah. Papers, Please at all, and that was a huge success. So already I'm being trained that marketing is not critical to to selling your game and to having people play it. Mm -hmm. And Papers, Please sold really well, and it still sells well. And so there was no real pressure on me for Oberdin to say, i got to market this, this thing, and it's got to sell a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't. And I, I kept a devlog because I like to talk about the stuff I'm working on. And when I work on different stuff in the game, when I finish something, it's cathartic for me to write a devlog post about it. So it feels good, and um, I like sharing that information. Uh, so the devlog is really the only thing that I did that would I would consider marketing, even though for me it was a more of an engineering thing than it was a marketing thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oberdin for me... So I had Papers, Please, and it was selling well, and it's kind of the only game I've made that's sold really well. But it's still selling well now, and so that tells me that uh, if I can make the right kind of game, then it's not something that needs to sell in the first three months only, and then I don't need to make all my money at the beginning, and I don't need to push this really hard to 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 get it to sell or to make a, a return on it. And so for Oberdin, I focus more on how can I make this game different enough from other games and Papers, Please is sort of like this too. Make it different enough from other games that if you want this kind of game, you pretty much just got to buy this one game. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want a game where you check passports, you got there's one game on the market that, that's like that, and it's Papers, Please. So if if you want a one-bit mystery game based on deduction, you know, or whatever kind of category I wanted to, to, to put this in, if you want that, then you got... I mean, there's Overden, and there's maybe a few others, but really, like, I'm not competing with tons of different titles all the time that are coming out every month. Mm -hmm. So the urgency of, of selling immediately and of doing the typical big marketing push with influencers and, and whatever they do these days was was never really there for me. 
from you know from internally it wasn't there from my my own personal satisfaction and then i felt like the way i was making the game over these years also didn't require that kind of that kind of push right on um i i think that's a very valid answer um uh poor unfortunately for poor sky uh, sky's like oh i do marketing so ouch um uh <laughs> it's it's um i i i guess that i have uh, i want to i guess i'll astrodongs which quite a name um just wants to say uh thanks for one of their favorite game experiences in years so uh and it felt like a game catered to their particular interests which kind of speaks to what you talked about of like making something that will appeal to someone and trusting that there are multiple someone's out there i guess that speaks yeah, to a lot it, of what you've said today yeah it's all that someone has always been me first basically yeah. i try to make the game that, that i because i i do play a lot of triple a games and i love triple a games and i play all that stuff but i i also really like these kind of very mechanical games that i make mm -hmm. so I, i'm always thinking okay i would like this kind of game and i hope other people do too and that's that was a, kind of a distant wish originally but since papers please i realized well okay there are enough people out there who like the same kinds of things that i do that will that will buy the games basically that will enjoy them just a fair warning for folks at home uh liam has entered the room liam do you want to say hi liam sure. we have a camera today everyone can actually say hi to liam for once uh he's here he's yowling he has opinions you may hear him any questions any questions for the cat um uh i as a quick follow-up um uh, it's interesting that you talk about how having there's only one passport checking game on the market. I guess there's two now because I don't know. I don't know. There might be more. I guess maybe a bunch of other people jumped on the papers. Please train that you built. But um, for sure we streamed um not tonight. Um, forgetting the developer name, but that was published by No More Robots, um, which disclosure my boss Simon helps them out. Um, we gotta do a lot of disclaimers on this show. We're just trying to you know keep no Liam don't chew that. I need that controller. Please don't chew that. Hang on. Come here. Okay, you're joining the stream now. Okay. Um, was there ever... This is something a couple other indies have been worried about now for a couple years, like Donut County. Um, was there ever any worry about uh, about another de another company swooping in and like uh, also doing the one-bit thing or also doing the detective thing? Mm, no. No? I, okay. I mean, I, I, yeah, I... I, if for not tonight, for example, I mean, I'm happy to see that kind of game. I'm happy to see all the games that were based on yeah. papers, please. And I, you know, I wish them all the best. And, and to be I clear, I'm not accusing not tonight of stealing your style. I'm just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. And they aren't. And um, you know, when I said the only passport game out there, I'm speaking of when I started over Dan and went, you know, for the last couple of years. So there are other games like it now, but originally, if you wanted that kind of game, you had to buy papers, please. So I get a couple years of you know the only option out there, which is what I was hoping for with over Dan. And mm -hmm. so if other people make one bit games or detective games totally fine i i will probably just do something totally different next time anyway so i'm not competing with them or myself or anything like that later so i personally i i have no problem with that and on sort of another level i when i make a game i don't necessarily think about how hard it would make how hard it would be for someone else to make this game but i do think about what other games could be transformed into this game and how hard would that be mm -hmm. uh, and i'm not aiming for something totally different but because i'm always thinking i don't want to compete with other people i'm sort of always thinking how can i do this thing differently than someone else would do it and that puts gives me a little bit more of a buffer between my games and other games i think as well right on um i'm gonna i'm gonna quickly check thank you all in chat for your love for liam uh he appreciates it he's a sad boy um, El Calha would like to know how experienced were you in Unity when you started development and how much of the game's development time was spent learning Unity? Uh, Unity I'd never used before this game. Like I said, the title screen was the first thing I ever made in Unity. Mm -hmm. uh, I have written my own engines though, C++ engines, and I've been a programmer for a long time in games, so picking up and using Unity was actually very quick, and that quickness and speed with which I made the title screen convinced me that Unity was definitely the way to go for this project. And it, based on my experience of making tools for AAA games and kind of working with lots of really good engines over time is that Unity is amazing. Mm -hmm. And especially for me on the editor side, the fact that you can 
add features to the editor and change things and then just alt tab back to the editor and in one second it's compiled and updated and you can now use your new tools was uh, a revelation. And so learning Unity was easy because a lot of people use it and then using it was was basically what allowed me to make this game. Even if we talk about how long it took, it wasn't because of Unity. Unity shaved a lot of time off this game and a lot of energy and effort uh, was saved by using Unity basically and I'm extremely happy with it. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, we're moving on to uh, next subject of conversation. Um, I want to follow up. Um, uh, you did. You did say that you had to put a lot of work into making these sixty characters happen uh, at the top of the stream. Um, twenty eighteen has been a, 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 and twenty seventeen have been years where developers have talked a lot about crunch. They've talked a lot about overwork. Um, I think. I think it's interesting in that the reason I think these two years of discussion have been particularly notable is that. It seems like a two years where a lot of developers, big and small, are trying to make concentrated efforts to say it does not take 100 hour work weeks to make interesting video games. Um, like they're trying to unhinge, you know, causation and correlation there. Um, what was your work like work life balance like working on Oberdin? And did you learn anything from your previous games that helped you take it easier on this project? Make, make, make right decisions about working long hours. What, what was your experience? Well, I um, I worked a lot on this game. One of mm -hmm. the problems with this game is that when I started it, I thought it would take me three to six months to finish. So imagine well, that, that, escal that escalated quick. <laughs> yeah, the unrealistically quick. I'm extremely bad at judging deadlines like that or judging pro progress. So imagine at six months, I'm basically crunching for a while to, to meet that first deadline. Uh, I sailed past that, and things cooled down a little bit. But then I say, okay, I just need another six months. And then we're good. So the next six months, I'm crunching again for a month to try to hit that deadline, and I and I miss it. So things cool down again. And imagine that repeated for four years. So I I crunched a lot on this game, and mm -hmm. I worked a lot on this. So this is unfortunately not a poster for for um, easy work. Uh, you know, it's one person did everything, all the modeling, design, programming. So any time that I got tired of doing one thing, I could switch to the other thing conveniently, right? It's great. Mm -hmm. Could keep working all the time. But the unusual thing here is that it worked for me. I, I love to work. It was only near the very end of the project uh, when I had, when I could see that the game was pretty much close to done and just needed some a little extra work to finish or some final polish or some playtesting. That's when it got really hard. But every other time, I, I loved working on the game. And I worked, that was, you know, I, I defined my own schedule. So because mm -hmm. I love working on the game, I wanted to work on it a lot. And then there was this other issue for me personally of, this is my follow-up game after Papers, Please, which won some awards and everybody enjoyed it. So how am I going to follow that up, basically? So that I can't just, like, quickly release some some game I'm not happy with. I need to make it something that I, I like and I hope other people will like. And that's that ends up taking a little bit longer, to tell you. So... Yeah, I, I think the only sort of bright side of that is that I define the schedule. I'm the one who decided I'm going to work all these hours. Mm -hmm. And personally, I work at home, so I could spend time with my family. I wasn't leaving them behind all the time. I could still just pop downstairs or into the next room and, and spend some time with them. Mm -hmm. So it, these long work hours for me were something that worked. It was something that uh, I didn't regret in the end. I think um, they were important to making the game even in four years. Uh, even though I made different parts of the game well, many times over and cut many things and threw a lot of stuff out, I feel like it generally worked okay for me. And I have some regrets about working that much, but because I am at home, working at home, uh, a lot of that stuff is just not as bad as it could have been if I had to go to an office somewhere. I guess I was going to follow up, but you sort of answered in there, like, I guess there is there is a palpable difference between uh, working at home and crunching for yourself um, versus going to an office and crunching on a larger company's behalf. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine like a hobby. It's, imagine you some hobby you really like. Yeah. If you just do that all the time, you're not killing yourself. I mean, it's hard physically as, as you get older, but you still enjoy what you're doing, and that's kind of was my situation. Yeah. Um, uh, did you do the music? Yeah, I did the music. That, uh, the symbol crash. I was going to say, the symbol crash that happens every time one pops up, uh, the, the spirit, you know, wanders around yeah. the ship. I was... Very impressed by that. Um, speaking of people who want to talk about features they're impressed with, um, 
Sasquatch, I'm assuming that's how you say your name, um, wants to say that they like the shake of the magnifying glass. It helps clarify its use. Same with the stopwatch and the fade in time, which you can see the stopwatch sort of doing that right now. Um, uh, Talismaniac would like to know, um, were you inspired at all by the vanishing of Ethan Carter? Oh, Liam's back on camera. Um, say hi to Liam. Um, uh, did vanishing of Ethan Carter um, influence your design at all here? Uh, that's a good question. So when I released the first demo, or I think maybe when I started talking about the mechanics in the devlog, uh, people asked me if I was basing this on Ethan Carter, and then the other one was Cryostasis, if this is based on Cryostasis. Mm -hmm. Those are two games I've never played, so uh, no. Um, I've heard good things about both of those games, though, and it, over the years, uh, let me say it, so working a lot on this game, I had very little time for other things, so I would give up, say, playing new games. And I have a huge mm -hmm. stack of games that I'm going to try to get to now that the game is done. And two of those games are Cryostasis and Ethan Carter. And uh, Edith Finch as well, I really want to play that. So all those games have similar concepts, but I was not influenced by those because I never played them. I think Liam knows he's on camera because he just walked off camera, but he's still hanging out here. Sorry, this is the most, this is the most engaged he's been with. Like, I think he really likes you, Lucas. Yeah, the cats when they hear my voice, man. My cat too. If he hears yeah. my voice, uh, he starts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Liam. Liam belongs to my good friend Kelsey. Um, we're we're cat sitting him, so unfortunately he's gonna he's not gonna be here permanently. But he's a very good, pretty boy. Um, these are very important dis discussions happening yeah. on the GDC Twitch channel right now. Um, uh, I have more questions. Um, we'll take some more from chat as they come. Um, uh, da, 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 da. um. I remember, I think I was reading through one of these things when I was doing research, and the dithering, to go back to the art and the dithering thing, since I think that's something, you know, a lot of devs are curious about with this game. Um, how does, you said some, there was a challenge early on, I think, in some other interview when it talk, came to, like, compressing video, like, and being able to make trailers for this game. How did that, how did the um, the one-bit resolution affect, like, you know, like, okay, like, it looks great when it's running on a computer, but it's time to put a trailer up and, oh no, the, the... Amazon smart machine woke up. Um, the uh, like, like, did that? I was. Did that have a thing at all? Is that something you had to be worried about with this stuff? Yeah, for sure. I. This is one of the things where. <clears throat> this is a really cool problem for me, actually, to have to realize there's a problem there and then to have to figure it out. Yeah. So I've got a I've got a low resolution one bit game with high contrast. So <clears throat> that does not compress well, in any scenario. So mm -hmm. I need to think about ways to to fix that. And the first way was. The first thing I did was, um, this will be kind of technical, but there's Bayer dither, which is a pattern dither, and there's a blue noise dither, which is kind of looks like random noise dithering. Mm -hmm. And Bayer performs really badly for compression because it's a regular grid that happens to be aliased with the uh, compression blocks of a video. So if you try to do everything Bayer dither, pattern dither, then it conflicts with the pattern of the compression, and it looks really terrible. But if you use noise dither, then... It still looks terrible, but it doesn't look as bad. So that was the first kind of realization and first fix, and that gave me hope for that maybe this could work. In the end, it doesn't actually work that well, but whatever, it's good enough. I, don't I don't play like, don't play in a movie theater. Yeah, I kind of like the idea that the only way to really see this game as it is is to play it on a computer. You can't watch a video of it. To that's play to play the oh yeah, I guess that's weird. Like it, I think a lot. Of, I mean, on the one hand, Twitch is good for marketing games. On the other hand, story driven games. You know, people devs wonder if they're losing customers because uh, they get... no, not in, not in that sense. I don't mind that at all. Oh yeah, no, that, I wasn't. I, I didn't mean want... that, like that yeah. people won't play it because it doesn't look good. I mean that if you want to see it as it really is, you've got that you can't just keep cranking up the video res. You've got to play it on a real computer, which is it's kind of cool to me. Yeah, um, I, guess, I guess you could say you need <clears> to play it on the smallest like machine possible, maybe. Yeah, right on, the, on a nine-inch screen. Yeah, yeah okay. I have a I have a Windows Surface in the background. I should uh, I should. Play it on that and see what happens. Um, that'll be fine. It's 1080p or whatever. Um, uh, da, 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 um, but actually, about that compression a little bit more. What, what I realized at some point during development is that compressors work a lot like the eye works. Mm -hmm. So that if your game doesn't compress well, then there's a good chance that it won't, like it, it won't work well with your brain, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's what led me to my second round of of um, dithering fix, which was to try to keep the dither from moving while you're looking around. 
Right on. Um, diving back into the chat really quick. Um, Albino Gorilla, I'm going to ask the first part of your question because uh, we already did sort of talk about the second part. But um, how do you stay motivated as a solo developer long enough to actually finish the game? It, well, like I said earlier, it's always games that I'm interested in or concepts mm -hmm. that I'm interested in. So if I'm not interested in it, that's a problem. But so far I've been lucky that I've kept my interest in these games long enough to finish them. Um, and I'm Sky. I think uh, I think at the front. What well, uh, you, you earlier you mentioned, Lucas. You mentioned a couple of Mac games that you said directly influenced this game. Uh, what what were those again? Uh, so visually, Beyond Dark Castle and Dark Castle were really uh, an influence on these. Um, Shadowgate was also a big influence. Mm -hmm. And there's another one called uh, Fool's Errand, which <clears throat> is was the one that's like really just beautiful. All the screens are, they're still screens, but it, the artist who created those was really really good. And that's always been kind of a uh, a milestone of what you can do with one bit for me. Right on. Um, I'm going to dive back to my question sheet as the <clears throat> chat uh, fans freaks out about Dark Castle. Um, I never heard of that game before, to be honest. You can't play it now. It's unplayable now, unfortunately. But uh, at the time, it was... Uh, I just mean the concept, design concepts are too hard to deal with. But at the time, it was really, really good. And it used the mouse and the keyboard in a way that... Uh, Made you feel like I own a Macintosh and I'm special because no one else can play this sort of game. <laughs> right on. Um, uh, I, I think I'll show it later in the video. Um, like I said, this is pre-recorded, so I, I can't just call this up on command. Um, but also with Return of the Oberdin, you can pop into the options and change specifically what kind of monitor this is, which mostly affects the color and shading. It doesn't change. Doesn't even change a lot for gameplay. It's just kind of a to taste like what's your retro computer of choice i guess right. um yeah. why'd you do that how'd you do that and was it worth it uh what do you think was really valuable about that um i probably don't think through everything that well actually this was <laughs> a case where i'd release a demo and then people said it would be cool if they could choose the two colors mm -hmm. black or white like, <clears throat> i had choose two mac plus style colors basically mm-hmm and I thought, okay, well, I don't want people choosing from a like an RGB control their two colors because that's a lot of work to make a control, and also most of those won't look good. So I'll just pick some colors myself, and then, well, what colors could I pick? Uh, the ba default colors are based on Mac Plus, so I'll just pick some other monitors, cool old monochrome monitors from that period. Mm -hmm. And I cheated a little bit because the Commodore is not monochrome, but uh, I use the two Commodore colors, uh, blue and, and cyan. So it was more or less just try to add a few in there and i researched a lot of those monitors and there weren't that many color options so you know kind of just stopped where it, where it was there and, and left it and right. it was easy easy to put in it's only changing two variables in the shader so it was trivial to add it and then it adds a little bit to the end why do you know when i <clears throat> when i was playing the game at, at the end before shipping we tested a lot one of the ways to sort of change it up for me anyways was just to change the color filter while i play through mm-hmm I was going to ask, why do you think why do you think people wanted that? Like, why do you think uh, why do you think developers should know that people wanted it? Um, that's a good question. I think probably because it's a PC game. People, <clears throat> PC gamers want options. You know, mm -hmm. they just want to because you can. You know, on PC you can open up the game files and do whatever you want. So just throw that sucker in the menu and save us all some trouble. Right on. Um, let me see here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna grab some water real quick. I'll be just give me like ten seconds. Oh, go for it. Yeah, I guess I'll just hang out with uh, chat. Um, uh, everyone, I guess, is talking about. Um, everyone's talking about Dark Castle and being able to play it again on other on other platforms. Um, Clifton B, I yeah, I kind of appreciate that too. The, this is one thing that really separates game dev from software dev. Some things just sound like a cool idea. They don't need to be focus tested. Uh, to heck before implementing them. Yeah, if you guys want a cat count right now, um, Liam is Liam's just off camera. Hey, Liam. Um, and Grunt, who's actually my cat, um, she walked into the room and she walked out of the room. So, um, all right, I'm back. Welcome back. Yeah, I guess maybe now that we're on GDC Twitch, maybe we'll get some work into getting custom emotes for all the cats who show up, who might show up on camera. Um, that might be fun. Um, yeah, simply AJ, we named Grunt after Grunt from Mass Effect, which um, I guess N7 Day was yesterday, so happy N7 Day if you're a Mass Effect fan like me. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to quickly check my notes, check my notes. Um, 
Lucas, uh, I guess I've talked to a lot of developers lately, and I've been talking to them about, you know, maintaining companies and, you know, figuring, you know, keeping them, like, being able to successfully make one game after another. Um, a lot of developers I talk to talk about taking techniques, code, um, uh, gameplay lessons. Like, they take a lot of, when they move from game to game, they are uh, adapting things they learned on their last game to their new game either for marketability purposes because they know that their company's fans want like similar but different um or it's because it's the way they can f keep the cost down is they don't have to teach themselves you know going from a 2d to 3d for instance is something that one developer might choose not to do because they know a lot about 2d and 3d would be very expensive to make um with your with your style of game making how do you what do you retain between games that you think has proven most valuable Yeah, I don't because I make different games every. I try to make different game every time. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like, usually nothing like code. There are some snippets of code that I keep around and I, I reuse, but and it's not assets. Um, it's not much of the production gets reused, but some concepts get reused. I, I will say on Papers Please, one thing I learned is that game has a certain level of jank to it, where mm -hmm. some stuff is just a little bit not great. And that was because I made the game in nine months, and I wasn't thinking long term that it's going to be a huge, you know, a success. So once that happened to me, I realized that a game does not need to be perfect to be good. Um, there's a saying I think it's uh, perfect is the enemy of good. So, and I also learned that at Naughty Dog actually in Uncharted One, mm -hmm. where my previous self before working there, I would say we well, got to fix all this shit. This is just totally too janky and looks like crap. But now I would say this is fine. This is I'm not trying to to make it perfect. Basically, I, what I have here is good. And if there are some janky things or slightly inconvenient things in this game, but leave it in. Uh, don't try to fix everything because a lot of times when you try to fix things, you break other things or you, in some way, you're messing with what you already have. So that's something I kind of. I learned um, through the years and I keep with me. Um, marketing wise, you know, I'm not thinking what I, okay, I'm a little bit thinking that I didn't do much marketing and it worked out okay. So I don't need to do marketing next time. And the, the same is true of publishing as well. Uh, I used to work with publishers. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with publishers in the late 90s when they had the print discs and I worked with them um, on Helsing's Fire for iOS. And one of the things I did with Papers, Please is I decided I'll just self-publish it. Valve is there, Steam is there now, it got through green light, so this makes sense. Uh, it's easy, technically. Um, and so I self-published that. And then for Oberdin, there were a lot of opportunities where I could have had a, could have worked with a publisher to do it and decided, well, fuck it, I'll just self-publish it again. And it's a lot of work and it's hard, but uh, there's a certain amount of satisfaction there just with doing everything yourself, so I did it. And it worked out okay, so that's another lesson that uh, I kind of tested and it worked out okay, and so I'll probably be self-publishing from now on, kind of thing. Right on. Um, uh, Sky Sky kind of agrees that publishers, I think, have just changed so much. You, you named three different eras of game publishing, and I think yeah. if there's one thing I've learned interviewing developers is that each of those eras, the the art of publishing and self-publishing is so different. You know, uh, public companies that were created in the CD era don't don't know anything about mobile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, Talismaniac, um, if you can't share this, you know, feel free to not feel pressured to share it. But Talismaniac would like to know if, um, do you have any Steam analytics on the average age of your purchasers? They are curious if it's higher than other games. Average? No, I don't know. Does Steam tell you that? I haven't looked. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't. I've, the only stat on Steam I looked at was how long people play. Mm -hmm. and it was above, above average. I don't remember even the number now, but it was above average for Steam games, which was satisfying. Nice. Nice. Um, let's see, we're coming up. Uh, I can't believe it, but we only have five minutes left in our hour. Um, if you're like me and you're on the West Coast, uh, you're probably either eating dinner or thinking about dinner. Um, uh, if you're on the East Coast, thank you for sticking with us. If you're in Europe, uh, goodness, it's, go to. I, did you just wake up? Do you need to go to bed still? Um, in any case, we're, we're thankful that you've all joined us. Um, now is the time to get your last questions in, uh, because we'll try to get as many as we can answered. Um, Ricardo DSC um, would like to know, what kind of software did you use to make the music? I used uh, Logic Pro X mm -hmm. on, on the Mac. And um, <clears throat> let's see, there's this uh, 
orchestral library called Decapo by Sono Kinetic, which I use for all the most of the orchestral stuff. I use some of the Logic built-in um, orchestral sounds as well. And uh, let's see, I use an, uh, Roland Integra Seven for some of the orchestral leads. And I think that's it. Um, MX Bug would like to know. Um, they say that uh, one grip, one bit graphics were a deliberate restriction, but did you find it liberating at the same time? Like once you pin that down, did it broaden the scope of what you felt you could do graphically? Yeah, definitely. And one other thing to help was low resolution. So the the game does not have a lot of particle effects, which is a common sort of special effects thing you see in games. Is lots mm-hmm. of particles everywhere. But because it's one bit and because it's low resolution, it allowed me to use dots instead, just like one pixel particles more or mm-hmm. less which you don't you don't see in a lot of games and that opened up a lot of like ideas about how to do effects and how to make things look in the game when when you're not working from the same palette as everybody else I, it gives me a lot of ideas about what i can do and one this one bit stuff was definitely a different palette right on um and uh i guess um i guess before we go uh oh we've got albino gorilla again uh are the raw assets created in monochrome or are they fully colored and textured and then down they are they're created in RGB, but I use the different channels for different things. So, for instance, <clears throat> the texture would only go in the B channel, and then the R and G channel would be used to define the dithering type mm-hmm. or to define where the outlines are going to be. So, I mean, if you look at them, it, my development view was this kind of multicolored view of the ship at all times, but it wasn't – there was a coded, encoded information in those colors. It wasn't necessarily, you know – the nor- normal tones you'd expect from the, the textures. That's interesting. So the colors were sort of like when you were working in Unity, the colors were there to tell you that a certain other thing was sitting under the color. Yeah, well, I mean the, the shader itself. Or, for, yeah. We'll, we'll look at the different channels of the texture and say, okay, for this pixel, I'm going to use this dithering. For that pixel, use this, this other dithering. Or they would define the edges of where the outlines are going to be. So if you just look at it, it's hard to see that stuff because it's all combined into one RGB texture. But the shader can suss that out. Very cool. Um, uh, with that, uh, I guess um, I guess my last question. It's not different than when I ask a lot of. Uh, it's different than when I ask a lot of game developers. Um, I guess what do you kind of hope? Uh, you know, people pick up Oberdin, they play Oberdin. What do you What do you sort of hope they walk away from the game with when they're done? Oh, I just hope they enjoy it. Yeah, but as fair. I said, like I, I, yeah. I made the game mostly because that's the kind of game I wanted to play. So if other people like it, that's a bonus on top. Uh, yeah, I hope they enjoy it, you know, and and one of the kind of lighter elements I tried to show in this game is that there's a lot of people on this boat, and they're just names and faces, but by the end of the game, I hope that you kind of have a sense of that they're people with their own lives and stories and, and stuff like that. I mean, that's not a main sort of force of the game or focus of the game, but I, do, I did want to show that that a ship full of people from all over the world can can both get along and fight and that they're all you know, can be interesting and, and that grows out of not knowing detailed stories about them but the sort of what you assign to them in, in your own playthrough so that, that was kind of a, a thing that I, I tried to add to the game I tried to make tried to give the game this sense of you first come on this and these are just names and you don't care but in the end you kind of know recognize these people and, and see them in a different way Right on. Um, uh, Albino Gorilla adds that they appreciate uh, that aspect um, of the game. Uh, okay. With that, thank you all for watching today. Thank you, Lucas, for coming on and talking with us. Yeah, it's great. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, in the chat. You've been... And you, Brian. Yep. Hey, I'm just here. I'm just here to pet the cats and uh, ask the questions. Um, uh, you've been watching the GDC Twitch channel. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this new adventure. If you know us from the Gama Sutra Twitch channel, please follow this channel now. Um, Gama Sutra is mostly just going to be hosting this for the time being, though we'll still, uh, you know, we'll still use that for discussions whenever the Gama editors just want to get on the horn and talk about, you know, how things are going in the year. Um, uh, we would love it if you hit that follow button. Because if you do, you'll get notifications when we go live and you can find out uh, when you can ask questions to game developers about who make the games that you like. Um, in the next couple weeks, we've got the Blackout Club. Uh, we're working on a chat with the, uh, um, what's this game called? It's a Mutant Year Zero. It looks really cool. Uh, Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden. That's it. Um, uh, I'm talking to some other PR and devs about getting their games on. Um,
it's been an interesting, you know, to end of the year is always interesting because big games come out and obviously those developers kind of want to go home and take vacations after they've launched their games, but there's a lot of devs who are down to talk and we're trying to talk to them right now. Um, uh, oh, yeah, quick shout outs to chat. Um, El Cajal, Clifton B, Sasquatch, Habana Gorilla, uh, Ricardia, Ric- uh, Ricardia, Ricardo Diaz C says, uh, thank you from Brazil. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you for tuning in uh, from so far away. I, Honest to God, um, Lucas, you're in Japan. I'm in California. Ricardo's in Brazil. If there's one thing that I've really been excited about doing these Twitch streams is that we all get to talk together about making video games, even though we are all uh, literally far away on the planet. And then um, the awkward pitch that follows up on that is that um, GDC will be March 18th to 22nd in San Francisco. And if you'd like to join us at GDC, um, you can scroll down and click the button and the re- you can register for your pass. Um, there's all kinds of different pass options for people from different backgrounds. We sincerely hope to make sure no matter what kind of developer you are, wherever you're coming from the world, that when you come to GDC, you're going to get something super useful out that will help you make interesting and uh, successful games. Um, with that, uh, Lucas, I always like to give give devs a chance. If 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 the folks at home watching would like to ask you more quest- detailed questions about making this game, where can they contact you? Twitter. Twitter. On, on Twitter. Yeah. Twitter. Find them on Twitter. Um, I think it's Duke Pope. Is that how you... Duke Pope. Duke Pope. Uh, that's how you can find him on Twitter. Um, with that, have a good day, everyone. Or good night. Good day, wherever you are. Bye.